Hey team, I'm Maddie. Welcome to Science Side Up. And today we're going to wrap up our discussion of natural climate change by talking about a naturally caused climate disaster, the year without a summer. It's May of 1816 and Mary Shelley, though at this point she's still Mary Godwin, um, she is traveling to Geneva with her stepsister and her fiance to spend the like spring and early summer there. While they're there, they end up being vacation neighbors with the famous poet Lord Byron. And I want to paint this picture for you because when I say Lake Geneva in the spring, I bet you're picturing something like this or this. Idyllic, serene, and nothing like Mary wrote about in her letters at the time. So in a letter to her to a friend dated um, May 17th, she wrote, Sometimes the road winds high into the regions of frost, and then the forests become scattered, and the branches of the trees are loaded with snow, and half of the enormous pines themselves buried into the wavy drifts. The spring, as the inhabitants informed us, was unusually late, and indeed the cold was excessive. As we ascended the mountains, the same clouds which rained on us in the valleys poured forth large flakes of snow, thick and fast. Between the snow and relentless storms, Mary and her companions spent much of that trip huddled together around the fireplace telling each other ghost stories. And this was when Mary started writing Frankenstein. And I certainly think that the ominous weather and circumstance of this Lake Geneva trip inspired a lot of Frankenstein. So I'm going to read a passage that I think really captures what Mary was feeling and experiencing that, that summer of 1816. Um, so in Frankenstein, this is about halfway through the story when Frankenstein's monster has escaped and run away and Victor has gone to look for him. The path as you ascend higher is intersected by ravines of snow down which stones continually roll from above. One of them is particularly dangerous, as the slightest sound, such as even speaking in a loud voice, produces a concussion of air sufficient to draw destruction upon the head of the speaker. The pines are not tall or luxuriant, but they are somber and add an air of severity to the scene. I looked on the valley beneath. Vast mists were rising from the rivers which ran through it and curling in thick wreaths around the opposite mountains, whose summits were hid in the uniform clouds, while rain poured from the dark sky and added to the melancholy impression I received from the objects around me. This dismal setting captured so eloquently by Mary wasn't limited to Switzerland or even Europe. It, it was a global phenomenon. In China and even more so in India, the normal monsoon season was so disrupted and wrong that there was just massive flooding everywhere. In North America, the sky was so perpetually hazy that people could look up at the sun and see sunspots with the naked eye. And throughout Europe, it snowed the entire year throughout the spring and summer. And in places like Hungary, the snow fell as red and brown. 1816 would become known as the year without a summer, and rightfully so. There was global famine from the United States to the Yangtze Valley, and the famine lasted for years, leaving globally tens of thousands of people dead. And all of this destruction, the flooding, the famine, the red snow, can be traced back to a volcanic eruption in Indonesia 
in April of 1815, Mount Tambora. How does a volcano in Indonesia lead to snow in Switzerland a year later? That's a great question, and we're going to go to the board and do some science and figure it out. When Mount Tambora erupted, it pumped a ton of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, it definitely pumped a lot of things, not just sulfur dioxide, and how a volcano affects the local weather is practically a scientific field in and of itself. But to simplify things and to get kind of the big picture, we're just gonna talk about the sulfur dioxide. That's one sulfur atom to every two oxygen atoms. Chemical symbol written like that. So the sulfur dioxide is really important for two reasons. One, it's shiny. And two, it was pumped into the stratosphere. So let's talk about those two things and see why that's what's important and how that caused our year without a summer. So first thing that our sulfur dioxide is shiny. Now way back in the like first video in our climate dynamics series, when we did black body radiation, we learned about how the incoming energy from the sun, right? about how much energy comes in from the sun and hits earth, how that's a very important factor for climate as, as we might imagine. So because sulfur dioxide is shiny, some of this incoming sunlight hits the sulfur dioxide and bounces back into space, never making it to earth's surface. So because the sulfur dioxide is shiny or reflective, it's going to cut down on the total incoming solar radiation leading to a cooler surface just because we're not letting as much energy make it in to begin with. So that's how sulfur dioxide affects the atmosphere and it affects cooling, right? So why is it important that it was in the stratosphere? Our atmosphere is broken down into four layers and the layer that you and I live in that are like buildings and mountains and plains, everything you and I do, we're in the lowest layer of the atmosphere called the troposphere. So I'm going to draw a line and we'll call everything down here. This is our troposphere. And then the layer directly above us is the stratosphere. So why is it important that our sulfur dioxide is in the stratosphere? Well, that's because it's actually really, really hard to get things from the troposphere into the stratosphere and vice versa. So most of the chemical reactions that remove unwanted things from the atmosphere, like sulfur dioxide, that's happening down here in the troposphere. So the importance of the sulfur dioxide being in the stratosphere is that it means it's gonna stick around for a long time. How long a specific like gas or particulate or aerosol or whatever have you is gonna hang out in the atmosphere is called its residence time. And that's something we're gonna be talking about a lot more moving forward. But for right now, it's just important for you to remember that because the sulfur dioxide was in the stratosphere, it was able to be around for much longer and therefore it could spread out over the globe, right? Earth, real big, Turns out it's pretty hard to have a local effect, like an erupting volcano, affect the entire planet because Earth real big. Um, but if, if, the, if the pollutant, the sulfur dioxide in this case, can hang out for years before it's removed from the atmosphere because it's in the stratosphere, then it has time to spread out over the whole planet and have global effects. So that's how an ex a volcanic eruption in Indonesia 
causes snow in Switzerland a year later. Now, quick note, not every volcanic eruption can do this, right? We didn't have global famine after Mount St. Helens erupted. So you need a really, really strong volcanic eruption to produce enough sulfur dioxide and get it up into the stratosphere um, in order to have the type of event like 1816. Now, a, a little caveat is that actually it's, it looks like there were multiple other volcanic eruptions in the previous years um, that collectively there was sort of a, a buildup of the sulfur dioxide that that eruption in 18, 1815 was able to kind of add on to. So the eruption of Mount Tambora wasn't the sole and only thing going on, but it was the most important thing going on. I hope that makes sense. One last thought on our naturally occurring climate disaster, and that is to think about the time scale, because that's something we talked a lot, about, a lot with our Milankovitch cycles. So this was a volcanic eruption that had really terrible effects on humans and on the planet for about three or four years. And then those effects dissipated. Like we said in those videos, a common criticism of ch climate change is, isn't it natural? And people will point to events like the Mount Tambora eruption and the resulting famine and say, look, something like that is what's going on now when we're measuring rising temperatures. And the answer to that is, well, not really. One, volcanic eruptions tend to lead to cooling, um, not warming, and, and two, the effects of a volcanic eruption die off pretty quickly, right? It's a sudden event with a sudden extreme response that then dies down and goes back. The system goes back to a steady state in equilibrium. Um, the issue with greenhouse gases and specifically carbon dioxide is that we are continuously pumping it into the atmosphere. So it's not so much that it is as though we are launching a volcano, right? But it is constant. So it's, it's a constant pumping of pollution into the atmosphere. So we're getting, and it's continuously increasing. So we're seeing a continuously increasing response. We're not letting the system, the atmosphere, get back to its steady state. Um, so we're going to talk a lot more about that. If that was confusing, I'm sorry. Um, stick around and we're going to start talking about climate forcings and, and hopefully all this stuff will clear up. Um, but I want to leave you guys with a beautiful poem by Lord Byron called Darkness that is definitely thought to have been inspired by this time period. I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went, and came and brought no day, and men forgot their passions in the dread of this their desolation, and all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light. So gothic, but so pretty, right? Ugh. So much poetry for a science video. Okay, team, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you are well and those you care about are well. Please like, subscribe, don't forget to be kind, and I'll see you all next time. Bye, team.